Welcome to the DePaul College of Law Blue Book Podcast, a series of podcasts designed to teach 1L students the basics of legal citation using the Blue Book. In the last episode, we learned how to form and abbreviate more case names using Blue Book Rule 10.2.1a, b, e, and f. This episode will complete our examination of the rules governing case name abbreviations under Rule 10.2.1g and h. This episode will also review Blue Book's general rules on abbreviations, numerals, and symbols under Blue Book Rule 6, and finally, italicization under Rule 7. You'll want to have a copy of your Blue Book in front of you as you watch this podcast. After watching this podcast, you should be able to complete Blue Book Homework 6 with the help of your Blue Book. First, let's take a look at our case name abbreviations under 10.2.1G and H. 10.2.1 10.2.1G tells us how to use surnames in forming case names. You can find an abbreviated form of this rule in blue pages at B4.1.1. When forming a case name for a case between two individuals, you should omit given or first names and initials of the individuals. In the case of Susan Smith versus Bob Jones, the case name would simply be Smith v. Jones. This surname rule doesn't apply where a business firm is using an individual's full name in its title. In the case of Susan Smith versus Bob Jones Incorporated, you would write Smith v. Bob Jones Inc. as your case name. Next, don't leave off any part of a surname that is made up of more than one word. If the person's name is entirely in a language from a culture that gives the surname first, such as Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and other Southeast Asian cultures, retain the full name. So in the case of Fa Mulan versus Timothy Ho, that would become Fa Mulan V Ho. I did not retain the Timothy because Timothy is not in the same language as Ho. Finally, Include all surnames after the first surname listed for the first party. In the case of D. Jean Ortega Peron versus Elizabeth Shea Halpern, you would write Ortega Peron v. Shea Halpern. If you're in doubt about which portions of the name to keep, look up the case name in the case name index of the reporter where you found your case. That will show you the proper abbreviation. Turning to Rule 10.2.1H, we'll be looking at abbreviations for case names and citation sentences where the case name includes multiple business designations, such as railroad, incorporated, corporation, and the like. If the name contains a word, such as association, brothers, company, corporation, or railroad, clearly indicating that the party is a business firm, you can omit the second business designation, such as Incorporated, Limited, LLC, NA, or FSB. This rule should be read narrowly, though. Do not omit the second business designation if the remaining name could be confused for a different business entity. For example, if you found the case of Five Brothers Incorporated versus Lincoln Ford Mercury Incorporated, and you wanted to abbreviate this case name for a citation sentence, Which of the following names would you use? The correct answer is the second one. Because the first party contains both Brothers and Incorporated, and both business designations are listed in 10.2.1H, I can eliminate the Incorporated. For the other party, however, I must retain Incorporated and abbreviate it as INC period. The second party's name does not contain one of the listed business designations, therefore I must keep it all in full. 
Next, we will review Blue Book Rule 6, which provides guidance on formatting abbreviations, numerals, and symbols. The Blue Book contains the specific abbreviations you should be using in your sites in tables T5 through T16. If the abbreviation you want to use isn't listed in one of those tables, you probably shouldn't be using it. Remember that these abbreviations are for your sites only. Don't attempt to abbreviate your main text in the same way you abbreviate your sites. Also, remember that abbreviations are context specific. For example, the abbreviation for district can be D period or DIST period, depending on what type of district you're abbreviating. Be sure you're using the appropriate abbreviation for your context. Many who are new to the Blue Book have a hard time deciding where to place spaces in sites, and spacing isn't always apparent from the examples in the Blue Book because of the proportional print in the book. Rule 6.1a provides the general rules regarding spacing so that you do not need to rely on Blue Book's examples for identifying where to place your spaces. First, be sure to close up any adjacent capitals. Northeastern becomes N period E period with no spaces. Wherever you have an abbreviation of two or more letters, provide a space both before it and after it. So if I were abbreviating the Illinois Appellate Court or Illinois Appellate, I would use ILL period space APP period space because both the abbreviation for Illinois and the abbreviation for appellate require spaces before and after. Numbers and ordinals be, may be made of two or more characters, but they should be treated as a single capital letter. Therefore, the re abbreviation for Northeast Second would be NE2D, all closed up with no spaces. Finally, close up any initials in names, such as AC Moore in the example below. Rule 6.1b tells us where to place periods when using abbreviations. First, use a period at the end of any abbreviation unless the last letter of the abbreviation is set off by an apostrophe. Therefore, the abbreviations for avenue and building would end in a period, but the abbreviations for association and department would not. If in doubt about whether your abbreviation requires a period at the end, consult the table where you found the abbreviation. All four examples listed here were pulled from table T6, starting on page 430. When an entity is known by its initials, you can leave out the periods. For example, the FBI is known by its acronym. Therefore, we can omit the periods when we write the acronym in our sites and in our text. Nevertheless, you should retain the periods in US and retain the periods and any other abbreviations of an entity that does not go by its initials. For example, New Jersey is abbreviated N period J period, but it is not known as NJ. You would retain the periods after each initial. The same holds true for New York and South Dakota. Rule 6.2 clarifies when you should spell out numbers and when you should use numerals. This rule applies to both your citations and your textual sentences. You should spell out numbers in a textual sentence when the number is under 100. You should also spell out numbers that begin a sentence, and you may spell out round numbers such as 100 or 1000 if you spell such terms consistently. On the other hand, you should use numerals when listing a mix of numbers above and below 100. Also, use numerals where the number you're writing contains a decimal point, percent symbol, or a dollar sign. Similarly, use numerals for sections, volumes, and subdivisions indicated by such symbols. Finally, use numerals and not ordinals when writing dates. So, when should you use ordinals and how should you format them? First, use numerals in your ordinals insights. 
This rule is already familiar to you as you've used ordinals to indicate the second or third series in your reporter abbreviations. Similarly, you've abbreviated the federal circuits by their ordinals in your sites. In textual sentences, you should use numerals when indicating ordinals over the tenth. Therefore, you would spell out ninth as a word, but use the number 11 followed by a th to indicate the eleventh. When you do use numerals in your ordinals, don't use superscripts. Many word processors will autocorrect and place your ordinal designation in small print above the line. These are called superscripts. You'll want to disable that autocorrect feature when working on your bluebooking. Next, when using an ordinal that has an RD or ND ordinal designation, you will include the N or R in the text. But when the RD or ND is in the site, cut the N or the R. For example, if you were writing about the 102nd Congress in a sentence, you would include the N in the ordinal designation after the two. But if you're referring to a second edition, second series, or third circuit, you would eliminate the N or R and retain the D alone. Rule 6.2 also clarifies when to use symbols and when to write out words such as section or paragraph. In general, use the word section or paragraph in a textual sentence, unless you're referring to the U.S. Code or a federal regulation. Look at this example. In your sentence, you're referring to section 127 of a state code. Which sentence would be correct? The sentence that uses the word section? or the sentence that uses the symbol for section. The answer is the first sentence. Since the sentence is not referring to a section of the U.S. Code, you would write out the word section. What about this example? You want to refer to Title 42, Section 1983 of the United States Code in your sentence. How would you do that? The answer is the second sentence. When referring to the U.S. Code, you would place the title number first, space, then U period S period C period, space, the section symbol, and end with the section number. Note that there is a space both before and after the section symbol. When referring to paragraphs or sections in a site, you should use the symbols. As you saw in the text example on the last slide, place a space both before and after the symbol. In these two examples, you're looking at the Minnesota statute and a case that would be cited to a public domain site. Though you haven't been required to use these yet, be aware that more and more states are moving towards this public domain citation and our pin sites to pages are soon to be replaced widespread by paragraph references such as this. When referring to dollar amounts or percentages using numerals, you should use the symbols. So if you spelled out the numbers, spell out the word dollar or percent. But when using the symbols, there's no space between the numeral and the symbol. Finally, remember that you shouldn't use a symbol to start a textual sentence. You can rearrange the sentence to avoid starting with the symbol, or you can simply spell out the words. The last rule to discuss in this podcast is Rule 7, using italics. So far, you have learned that italics may be used for case names, though not on Blue Book homeworks. You can use italics under a few other circumstances as well. First, you can use italics for emphasis. Use this de device sparingly, though, because when overused, italics will lose the rhetorical punch. Second, you should use italics for foreign words and phrases that haven't been incorporated into American usage. For purposes of this rule, most Latin phrases have been incorporated into our own usage, but if a phrase is long, uncommon, or obsolete, you should italicize. Of course, if you find yourself using such a phrase in your writing, you probably should think about deleting it rather than italicizing it, as those phrases fly in the face of our plain language principles. Like case names, ids, 
and procedural phrases are also italicized, or in the case of Blue Book homeworks, underlined. There are three additional uses for italics under Rule 7. You should italicize letters representing hypothetical entities, as in this example of A and B. You should also italicize lowercase l when used on its own so that the reader doesn't confuse the l for a 1. Finally, you should italicize equations. You have now completed Blue Book Lesson 6 and are ready to tackle Blue Book Homework 6 with the help of your Blue Book. If you have any additional questions, see your LARC professor or a TA.